depicts a mystery as old as the landscape itself. Where does it go, this stream that plunges underground and then turns up at Ingleborough Cave further down the mountain? Connecting the two has been the obsession of cavers since their sport began more than a century ago. In 1970, they believed the link was at last within reach. That year, the BBC World About Us made this film of their adventures. High up on the Pennine Hills of northwest Yorkshire, a river, Fell Beck, begins to carve its way between the limestone folds. Almost before it's begun its journey, it becomes lost. The water spills down a hole, gaping gill. What happens to it? No one knows. Beneath the moors of Ingleborough, a labyrinth of caves and passages has been carved out by water. Over millions of years, the inside of that mountain has been eroded away. The honeycomb remains, and so does a mystery. The river water has gone. Up on the moors, where the river might have run, it's dry. And underground, where the fast-flowing water might be found, there's none to be seen. The river goes in at one end, and two miles away, and 500 feet lower down the slopes, it breaks into daylight. For a hundred years, cavers have challenged the dark secrets of Gaping Gill. Some have died, all have failed. Another small group of cavers arrive at Ingleborough. Why have they come? To discover a new cave, they'll say. In truth, they each come for a different reason, to test their own physical and mental qualities in the caves of Gaping Gill, to submit to the dark and dangerous passages and if they can take it, to know a little more about themselves when they emerge. But whatever their reason, they all accept the challenge in the caverns below ground. The prospect of difficulties and hardship is, for them, just an incentive. The bond of comradeship is both vital and reassuring. The possibility of real danger adds spice to the air as they prepare for another expedition. The ropes and ladders, the jumble of gear with dried mud from the last trip is cleaned and sorted out before moving off. Each caver is responsible for his equipment, and since his own safety may depend on a knot free rope or a lamp which lasts, the wise man checks it all. Until a hundred years ago, what happened to Fellbeck when the river spilled down Gaping Gill was a mystery. The fine spray rising like smoke from the black depths gave rise to superstitions. They said those who went near became touched with the devil's breath. On one occasion, a long length of string was run down without finding bottom, and this seemed to confirm that it was an abyss into the bowels of the earth, so God-fearing folk stayed away. In 1872, John Birkbeck attempted the first descent. He was lowered over and reached a ledge 190 feet down. Before the fraying rope parted, he came back. It was a Frenchman, Edward Martel, who caused a minor sensation in Yorkshire. He was a well-known caver in Europe and had made a number of discoveries in France and Spain. His ladder was made fast by a double rope to a stout post and he disappeared down the hole. He climbed down through the waterfall, past the ledge reached by Birkbeck and touched the floor of a cave. It had taken him just 23 minutes. From the top, the waterfall measured 365 feet, more than twice the height of Niagara Falls. Martel made a sketch. They thought he must be exaggerating. His discovery stimulated the local cavers. Yorkshire Ramblers Club, foiled in their attempt to be first down, brought in a winch. When they got over their chagrin, they realised that he'd made a significant discovery. It was undoubtedly the reason for the upsurge in interest. By the turn of the century, even intrepid Edwardian ladies were taking a trip down Gaping Gill. The styles of the day may have been unflattering, but the girls themselves must have had nerves of steel even to attempt the drop into darkness. However apprehensive their feelings, the swinging set of the day went down, but whether they enjoyed it or not has never been recorded. Today, they still hold winching meets, twice a year when the equipment is brought in and those who wish can go down. The club say the ride down is free. It's the haul back up that costs 10 shillings.
A man becomes no more than a spider when he drops into the main chamber of Gaping Gill. There is over 300 feet of rapid descent and it's one of the tricks played on experienced cavers to let the winch drum run full speed and then break at the last moment. The chamber is of vast proportions, 110 feet from roof to floor, 480 feet long and 82 feet at its widest. The cavern could comfortably hold York Minster and it's the largest natural chamber in Britain. It was formed by the action of water and ice during the Ice Age. A fault in the substrata caused a slip and huge quantities of the melting ice waters washed away the shattered rock. And at the bottom of the cave should be the site all cavers have come to see, a magnificent waterfall. But the most remarkable and yet tantalising feature is this waterfall. When the spray hits the floor, the water seeps out of sight. The rounded boulders act as a kind of filter and the river quite simply disappears, not to be seen again until it reaches Ingleborough Cave. So the real quest to find the course of the river began. There was no chance to follow the water itself, and the Frenchman, Martel, had said there was no way out of the main chamber. Yorkshire Ramblers Club proved him wrong. There was an air of stillness, almost timelessness, about East Passage, created by the stalactites hanging from the roof. Often cavers had to break off these precious formations in groping forward. Often, too, they had to move boulders and dig away the floor. By flickering candlelight, it must have been an eerie experience. East Passage carried no stream. It was all but filled with clay left by the glaciers. Inevitably, clay and mud sealed up the cave. At the same time as East Passage was discovered, the early 1900s, the cavers from Yorkshire Ramblers Club found a branch passage leading from it. This led to the second big discovery, Southeast. The direction gave the cave its name and also suggested a route towards Ingleborough Cave. It was like a railway tunnel, smooth and oval shaped. This kind of cave was formed when water under high pressure once filled the passage completely. Fellbeck must have flowed this way when it was much larger than today. For the caver, it means walking at a back aching continuous stoop, not low enough to crawl, not high enough to enjoy. The end was a collapse of boulders and still no sign of a river. Around the turn of the century, the Yorkshire Ramblers had pushed a third of the way from Gaping Gill into the mountain, encouraged to be going in the right general direction and by developments at the other end of the system. Ingleborough Show Cave is just beside the outfall of Fellbeck. The river breaks out of the mountain and flows down to the village of Clapham. The show cave once reached only 70 feet into the hill, where the way was barred by a stalagmite wall five feet high. The old water line still shows on the limestone rocks. Following a flood in 1837, the owner of the local estate ordered the dam to be broken down. Hundreds of tons of water were released, and half a mile of new caves revealed for the first time. Water streams down walls and drips off roofs. Limestone suspended in each droplet is left behind in minute grains and slowly builds stalactites and stalagmites. Faster running water creates its own form of underground architecture. Yet a million years of flowing water is still not enough to carve out these shapes. Where the public today come to a stop, the original explorers carried on.
even ladies of the day dressed in crinolines were coaxed to explore this section of passage. The pools through which cavers must now wade have only formed in recent floods and were then dry. But it was from here that the real problem started. It must have been the lure of running water that coaxed them on. The passage was only two feet high. Along the floor on which they were forced to lie ran the elusive Felbeck. They named it Lake Avernus, after the volcanic lake in mythology known as the submerged entrance to hell. The original explorers were dressed in nailed boots, heavy tweeds, old coats and bowler hats. Instead of lamps, they had candles. When they came to the lake, there was only one thing to do, swim for it, with their candles stuck in the bands of their bowlers. For almost 20 years, nothing happened. Until 1937, no new discoveries were made. Then this man, Eric Hensler, came to Gaping Gill for the first time. A friend, Eli Simpson, suggested that the best way to learn about the passages below would be to crawl about a bit, to try his luck. His luck held. Beneath the moors, for a distance of nearly a mile, Eric Hensler crawled quite alone. His compass told him he was heading in the direction of Ingleborough Cave, but he had no idea where he was. Here's a reconstruction of how Eric Hensler set about it. As always, he got his pipe going well and then set off. He climbed through a crevice and found himself in a narrow passage. Soon he was crawling on his stomach along a bedding plane, extremely flat and unrelenting for over a quarter of a mile. Eventually, he stood up. He'd entered a water-worn passage 10 feet wide and in places 60 feet high. Then, further on, the roof lowered and the way ended in a muddy sump pool. He'd been alone, away from his companions, for six hours, but he discovered a section which would lead others to discover much more. Eric Hensler became the doyen of the caving world and they named the passage after him. A few months later, they even had a dance down Gaping Gill. The English Folk Dance Society put on a show for the potholers. Then came the war. The painstaking exploration by the old Yorkshire Ramblers on either side looked like blind alleys after Hensler's discoveries, which included a stream. But that in turn ended in a sump. Maybe the way forward wasn't so clear. Since Hensler's discovery in 1937, no new passages of importance had been discovered. New entrances, yes, but no extensions to the known system. Then, in May 1968, there was one weekend's exploration which was unique. Two new passages were discovered which pushed forward a third of a mile. The surveys showed that they were now over a mile from Gaping Gill, far over the hill, and that the passages were heading for Ingleborough Cave. They named them Whitson Series, and far country. It took four hours to travel through to the end of Whitson series and the caving task was Herculean. It was rated in caving terms as super severe. Only an expert could hope to get through.
Perhaps it was the contrast from the liquid mud they'd just been through which made the white stalactite seem so delicate, and as the caver spoke, it vibrated. The passage itself was probably one of the earliest in the system, now blocked in mud and with these stalactite formations as the caver's only reward. At the very same time, the two Brook brothers, who were first becoming well-known in caving circles for their persistence in pushing into new passages, climbed up the old iron ladder from Hensler's master cave. They were looking into a supposed connection with East Passage suggested by a survey. The survey proved faulty, but the two men found a draft through a minute hole. They enlarged it enough to squeeze their bodies through and they were into a new passage. A completely new network led directly towards Ingleborough Cave. They had crawled a mile of the most difficult conditions of caving known in Britain and had closed the gap to a few hundred feet. The sense of isolation and claustrophobia here, cavers say, is almost unbearable. After 30 years of exploration had only made for a more complicated map, the Whitson series and Far Country leapt forward like new arches of a bridge which was also being extended from the far side. The gap was narrowing. What was needed now was a new technique and a new breed of caver. Only a skin diver of skill and daring could tackle the dangerous flooded passages and Mike Wooding, an experienced diver, came to the Ingleborough Caves to accept the challenge. Diving in, in caves has its own particular problems. For a start, you're in a hostile environment. You're cold, you're probably wet, and it's dark, and people around you are anxious. This alone is enough to unnerve a lot of people. Cave diving can be dangerous. There have been quite a number of fatalities, proportionately. You can't really give a reason for these. It's the price you have to pay in any sport of this form, if you can call it a sport. But if you're going to push things, you're going to have danger. I started cave kind of diving in a rather odd way. Most people go caving for a few years and get interested in diving somehow and gradually creep into it. I started caving because of climbing, actually. I had a lot of friends who were badly injured, a couple killed. I decided to have a go at caving, it's something different. In caves, of course, when you're diving, you're in a passage which is often constricted, very, very dark, psychological aspect of you know, fear. And you know, or you should know, that if anything goes wrong, you can't just ditch your gear and come up. You're really in you know, quite a spot when something does go wrong. The first time I dived in, in Inglebrook Cave, it was very much a working dive, but the results that came out of it and the atmosphere of the place and the potential, you know, I'm very much involved with it. The journey into the Terminal Lake Sump, from which the dive was to be made, was difficult with the new and unfamiliar equipment. The air bottles were packed in protective cylinders and the vital valves, airlines and face masks stowed in watertight ex-army ammunition boxes. By pushing and pulling, the stuff got there somehow. An inflatable dinghy was prepared for launching. They thought it would help Mike to set off on his dive if he could start from the dinghy and not from the sheer face of the rocks of the cave. The air bottles were unpacked and checked over. In normal circumstances, they'd give him two hours of air. That was his maximum lifespan if he ran into trouble, just two hours.
Over his rubber headgear, he wore his caver's helmet, almost as vital as the air cylinders. In one hand, the waterproof battery lamp, and in the other, he trailed a line from a reel. This was his lifeline. His only means of getting out was to follow the trail of the orange-coloured string. It was already two and a half hours since they went underground. Mike Wooding carried out a final check and prepared to disappear into the cold black water. For the Sherpas, those cavers of the support party who came to help with the equipment, the prospect at best was a long wait. Cave diving has been through tragic times. Three years ago, there was a 15% fatality rate per year among cave divers in Britain. And in one disastrous period, for every 15 dives made, someone died. There was a psychological barrier to be overcome, knowing that there was no air above, just solid rock. The cave diver had little chance to learn from his mistakes. After an hour and a half, Mike returned. You, you know, I left you. Halfway through, you come into clear water, crystal clear water. It's just as if you're hanging there, you know, suspended. Then up into chambers, big dry chambers. We must be fairly close now. We're about 500 feet from the terminal sump. When word went round the villages, a rival cave diver appeared. Tom Brown from Berry was in the village of Clapham within days of hearing that cave diving was going on. He came as a rival and stayed to make a two-man team. It's a pretty long carry, I'm afraid. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's about an hour's trip. From here, you got vaguely north to the end of Far Country. And uh, these are very rough sketch surveys. Um, you, you know what I'm like on directions. The uh, scales are yeah, but, uh, yeah. scales are approximately the same. Your first sump is 300, with your inlets running off, and a 220. And then, if you add your next bit like that, lines up. And this is the dry stuff, the new high level stuff. So, mm -hmm. um, allowing that most of this will be lined up along the joints. We get something probably like that. Underground surveying was a less than exact science, but the map makers inked in the dry chamber, Gandalf's gallery, that Mike Wooding had discovered beyond his dive. Another giant span in the bridge. The cavers prepared to make the join. It was decided to send a group in at the top end, the gaping gill end. They'd go down to Disappointment Pot and travel to the far country. If a cave diver coming up the other way did break through, there'd be proof of it. And if he needed help, they'd be on the spot. On this trip, there'd be seven pitches varying from 20 to 100 feet. It'd take 300 feet of lightweight ladder and the same length of lifeline rope. It meant a heavy load was going in. Ahead of them, six hours of the most gruelling caving, including the most difficult part of all, the far country. One of the first tasks was to use again the old trick of fluorescent dye. If a cave diver noticed green water, he could try to follow its track. But mindful of the reaction of the villagers of Clapham, whose drinking water it is, they used it sparingly. If Mike or Tom swam out to a dry passage, they might be very close. 
a whistle might just be heard. In some caves, the sound carries long distances, and anyway, it was worth a try. The cave divers brought in an air compressor for their cylinders so that they could dive into the flooded passages every day when the weather was right. For weeks, the daily routine for Mike and Tom was to check the gear, fill the air bottles and go down again. There were so many caves to explore, they might break through tomorrow or it might take years. All they could do was try. These two divers, trying so hard to make a breakthrough that few others care about. Why do it at all? The reasons I started cave diving are completely different from the reasons I'm cave diving at the moment. It's always been considered one of the dangerous aspects of caving. That added an attraction in itself. The thing I realised was the fact that there's a lot to do with yourself. It's very deep down, deep down inside itself. You're always trying to push yourself to the limit. But you never quite know where or what the limits are, either in yourself or in the stubborn intricacies of the limestone that still barred the way between Gaping Gill and Ingleborough. It had all seemed so close, but it was to be not days, but 13 years before a new team of explorers felt confident enough to summon a film crew as witnesses again. And that's another story. Thank you.